Hi, welcome to the Insights from Dr. Intimacy YouTube webcast. I am your host, Prophetess Lanine Hanaya, aka Dr. Intimacy, and I will be giving you an enlightening look into the naked truth about sex, relationships, and intimacy from a spirit, soul, and body perspective. I am very, very excited. I'm actually continuing with my series on incubus and succubus sex demons and, and we are actually getting down to the end of this series talking about my favorite part of this which is the, the deliverance so many people teach on things without actually giving you the empowering tools to help you uh, get delivered and so I've been very excited this is the third session now dealing with deliverance and I, I believe with this is the 11th video in the series if you haven't seen the rest of the videos please go back and watch the rest of the videos they really build each video builds on the uh, one that came before it it is really line upon line precept upon precept in terms of getting some in-depth understanding of this topic which is so prevalent in the body of Christ and yet very few people are talking about it very few people so I'm excited I feel blessed and honored that I, I've been handpicked chosen anointed and appointed by Yahweh the Creator himself to actually bring this information to you I know it's helping a lot of people I've gotten a lot of testimonials in and I'm, I'm excited about that so let's get back into it Again, just showing you the book, The Spirits of Sexual Perversion Reference Book, which you can pick up at my website, drintimacy.com. You'll see the book there. It is currently out of stock, but if you go in and buy a gift certificate, the book will be restocked in just a couple of weeks now. And if you go ahead and purchase a gift certificate on the website, you will be notified before the book is released to the public so that you'll get one of the first copies before it sells out. So please do that. And your purchases help the book to get restocked more quickly and, and helps keep it stocked so that it doesn't continue to sell out because it does uh, sell out rather quickly. But let's get back into these deliverance steps I was on step number five we talked about so far uh, uh, and again just that disclaimer that I'm putting out there any reference to kill murder abort is talking strictly spiritually I am not suggesting um, that you actually harm physically yourself uh, a child or anybody involved in your life that may be operating under some spirit of perversion any reference to kill murder, abort, these are all words, spiritual terms that I'm using, talking about verbally denouncing these spirits and pleading the blood of Yeshua for your victory, okay? But we talked about step number one, you must renounce not only the spirit, but also their work. Step number two, uh, just understanding that it may take some time to get complete deliverance, so you have to continue to denounce uh, and take that, take those communions to break those spirits, abort the seed. Step number three, don't ever let an attack carry on without challenging it. So while the attack is occurring, if you want to break the cycle, because it may continue to happen when you first start going through the deliverance process, you have to continue to challenge those attacks every time they're starting. Uh, and you can watch the prior video to get more information about any of these steps. I'm not going to go over them again because I discussed them thoroughly. Step number four for attacks that are occurring while you sleep. Apply the blood of Yeshua to your mind and renounce these spirits before you lay down. You want to command your subconscious mind to wake you up if you begin to have an attack during your sleep so that you can fight back. That's very important. And so now we're going on to step number five let's read step number five it is very very important that you consecrate yourself and the word consecrate means to separate yourself or to set yourself apart so you really want to separate yourself from everything every evil influence you want to set yourself apart unto the most high and holy God for his purposes and his righteousness 
every spirit must be cast out of your life and every door closed as much as you are capable of doing. Okay, I know that you may be still developing spiritually. You may not be as mature as some of your mentors or some of the people that you look up to, but it, it is important and you are obligated to do what you can do. You may not be able to do everything right now, but you're obligated to do what you can do. Whatever you've been equipped with, with, with whatever you have learned so far, you must apply it. You must apply it. Uh, so as much as you are capable of, close every door, cast every spirit out of your life. That means that you do not, you do not willfully involve yourself in anything at all that is sinful or ungodly. So you're not going to willfully involve yourself in anything at all, not on purpose, that is sinful or ungodly. When you do fall or make a mistake, you must repent and get up quickly. Okay, the righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up. Don't wallow in it. Not that you will be perfect. No one is. But every sinful and carnal area of your life must be challenged to the max. Okay, everything's got to be challenged. This is especially true when you are in the midst of a deliverance process. Okay. So don't let any sin in your life go unchallenged. You want to challenge every carnal uh, uh, stronghold in your life. If you watch a lot of TV, it needs to stop. As a matter of fact, while you're going through deliverance, I know this sounds really bad, but you need to not watch TV at all. You need to not listen to secular music, period. You need to not read any magazine or book other than the Bible or something that is is deliberately building you spiritually period because there are so many influences in uh, in those materials and that media that can draw you back and hinder your deliverance process so you want to commit to fasting and praying the scripture says that these kind come out by nothing but prayer and fasting uh, you're going to have to implement the power of prayer and fasting if you really, really want to be free. You know, I had somebody write me on, uh, on, my, on my blog maybe about a month or so ago, and she was having some serious um, attacks from Incubus. And I told her she needed to check out the, the article and to apply the deliverance steps. And uh, she wrote me back maybe in a couple of days, and she said, I did it. Now what? Well, this is not something that you can actually uh, accomplish in a couple of days. Deliverance is a process, not an event. Uh, deliverance is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's, it's a series of things that you're going to do over a period of time that is gradually going to lead to your freedom. Uh, I read another comment from the blog where a gentleman talked about he went through a deliverance session. Deliverance doesn't happen in a session. A, a portion or an element of deliverance may happen in a session. An element of your deliverance can happen over a couple of days. You're, you're experiencing deliverance right now as you're listening to me, as you're watching me. Deliverance is happening right now. You are, you are ensuing the process of deliverance right now, watching this video, watching this series. But it is a part of of a process. This is one thing that you're doing that is a part of a process that is going to lead to your complete deliverance. So uh, this particular lady had been having these issues for a number of years and in a couple of days felt that she was completely delivered. Well, I, I, I find that very hard to believe. I doubt it because one of the things that you want to do is pray and fast. You want to pray and fast. When I really needed to be delivered from, from something, uh, a serious stronghold that I had in my life for a number of years and just kept falling back into it, no matter what I did, I had to go on a fast. You know, the Holy Spirit kept talking to me about going on a fast. And, you know, you can look at me and see that I'm not that big. I don't have a whole lot of meat to spare. <laughs> I may seem really deep and prophetic, and I am, but I don't, I don't really like fasting. I don't like starving myself. 
Um, I have a high metabolism. I burn through food quickly. I get hungry easily. I didn't want to fast. But for three years, I kept asking him for help in this particular area of stronghold that I had. And his answer kept coming back to me the same. These kind come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. And I finally went on a 21-day fast, 21 days. I just kept praying. I said, Father, I need you to help me. I don't like fasting. I don't know how to fast. When I try to fast, I get hungry by 12 p.m. I feel like I'm going to faint. And, uh, you know, I'm just being really real and transparent and honest with you. This is my story. And I kept praying and leading up to that time. Like, I need you to give me some grace. I need you to send people that I can glean from, that I can hook up with, somebody that I can connect with. One can chase a thousand, but two can chase 10,000. And, and he did that. See, if you really, really want something, if you really desire something, ask and it shall be given. He gave me that grace that I asked for. He gave me the people to help me. People that I hadn't spoke to in years and some that I had never even met showed up to pray with me during that time of fasting to undergird me. And uh, I was just amazed. I was able to complete a 21 day fast, 15 days with no uh, food at all. And it was just amazing. And I'm telling you, that issue that I had had in my life for three years, it broke. I mean, it broke completely. It was shattered. So you might not be able to do 15 days without food right now, but can you get sweets out of your life? Can you get TV out of your life? Can you get games out of your life? Can you get, you know, what can you omit? What can you sacrifice right now? Something that, that is really going to be sacrificial that you can let go because it, it can be a process working your way up to being able to really uh, withdraw and seclude yourself in prayer and fasting. And when I started that 21 day fast, I didn't go straight into not eating. My body wasn't accustomed to that. What I did is I just gradually started to eat less and pray more. That's what I did. I ate less and I prayed more. And it was by, uh, it was by the sixth day that I actually went into not eating any food at all. But it just began with me eating less and praying more. And so as my body was getting used to not having so much food and getting used to accustomed to being able to function on less food, my spirit man was getting stronger because I was praying more daily and reading the scripture more. And so it's really, really important. You have got to commit to praying and fasting. If you're having some serious issues with incubus, uh, with sex demons, with bitterness, with unforgiveness, with witchcraft, it doesn't matter what it is, depression, suicide, whatever your issue is, fa prayer and fasting will take care of it. But you need to be committed to it. You really, really need to be committed Pray about how you can fast, what you can fast from, you know, take into consideration medications and things like that. But everybody can fast from TV. There's nobody that's going to be physically harmed by, by going on a nice TV fast, a secular music fast, a video game fast, uh, a, a cell phone game fast, a Facebook fast, a MySpace fast. Uh, people even use MySpace anymore. But a social media fast. You know, everybody can fast like that. Everybody can fast from sweets and junk food. Um, and so there's really no excuse. Maybe you can't do 21 days with no food, but you can do something. And again, this is about doing what you can do, because when you do all that you can do, that is when the father shows up with his supernatural to make up for the part that you can't do. And his grace will overtake you and you will be amazed at what you get accomplished. So really, really commit to fasting and praying, praying and omit, get rid of every influence in your life, every carnal influence, every sinful influence, all the people, places and things that have brought sin into your life or temptation into your life. You need to consecrate yourself, separate yourself from those things completely. This is Dr. Intimacy. You've been watching the insights from Dr. Intimacy YouTube webcast. That is my time for this particular segment. 
I'm very excited to reconnect with you on the next segment and to continue talking about the next steps in the deliverance process from uh, sex demons and, and really any type of stronghold that you're having, but specifically these sex demons. Remember to share these videos on your social media pages to help bless somebody else with it. And I look forward to sharing with you on the next segment. Thanks. Hi, welcome to the Insights from Dr. Intimacy YouTube webcast, and I am your host, Prophetess Lanine Hanaya, aka Dr. Intimacy, and I will be giving you an enlightening look into the naked truth about sex relationships and intimacy from the spirit, soul, and body perspective. So excited to have you back with me. I am continuing and uh, drawing to the conclusion of my series on incubus and succubus sex demons, we have had quite an extensive study on this. It's, it's been very exciting, very fruitful, and I'm going to continue with the deliverance steps. We left off in the last segment, I left off talking about step number five, consecration. And we're going to go right into step number six. Uh, and step number six is to get and study STD, sexually transmitted demons, and my book, The Spirits of Sexual Perversion Reference Book, and the Bible, because there are a lot of scriptural references in, in that book that can help you. And I'm going to just take a moment to talk about these books because they're very important. Um, I'm actually reading out of the book right now, and what it says is, if you are experiencing these attacks, it makes it apparent that you do not have a full understanding of sexual perversion and how to walk in total deliverance. Remember that any weakness in your life will invite these spirits in to attack you. You need to have a complete and full understanding of sexual intimacy, sexual activity, and sexual perversion. What it is, the purpose for it, and the remedy. You will learn this in these two books. No sexual stronghold will be able to stand in your life once you learn and apply the principles in these books, along with your personal Bible study notes. Furthermore, understanding these teachings will help you develop your intimate relationship with God the Father and strengthen all of your relationships. And I just want to definitely take a moment to highlight this important step because as I said in the last segment, deliverance is a process. It's not an event. It's a process that you're going to have to go through. And one of the steps of deliverance in the book, I talk about the 12 steps of deliverance. And one of those steps is the renewing of the mind. You know, the scripture says to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. And a lot of times what happens is you watch a good video like, like you've seen in this series and you're very excited and uh, you feel changed. Maybe you go to a really great conference or revival and you feel changed, but there's no longevity to the change. You will find that within a couple of days, weeks, or months, you return to whatever it was that you that you changed from. And that's the problem with change. Change can be temporary. Uh, change is not permanent. But the Bible says to be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, change is temporary, but transformation is permanent. When you are transformed, you can never go back to what you were before that transformation took place. And so the reason that I encourage you to get these books is because this is what is going to help renew the mind for that transformation. Not a temporary change, but a complete transformation from who you are now to who you really want to be in Christ and in the kingdom. Um, let's start with uh, STDs. I haven't shown you this one. This is STD Sexually Transmitted Demons. This is a powerful little book, and if you don't write, like reading long books, this is a great book. It's actually less than 100 pages. It's written in really simplistic language. I actually wrote it with young people in mind, um, uh, teenagers and young adults, 
but I have found that the older people have been just as overwhelmingly blessed by it as the young people. This is an easy read, something that you can sit down and probably finish at bedtime, but it is so, so powerful. It really breaks down what happens spiritually when you have sex. It is talking about the spiritual dynamics of what happens, demonic transfer, how it ex affects your personality, your character, your relationship with your parents. Uh, it talks about deliverance. It talks about worship, passion, how to deal with how to deal with physical sex, the natural urge to want to have sex, not the demonic part, but just that natural urge of what do you do with that. Um, it talks about soul ties. It really digs into soul ties. This is a great book. It's a testimonial. I tell a lot of stories about my life in here. When I first began having uh, sex when I was 15 years old, I talk about those stories and how I became very promiscuous very quickly after that first encounter and how it just really destroyed the fabric of my life. And so this is really going to give you an in-depth understanding of, of uh, how demons work in your life sexually, what happens when you have sex, and what's going on spiritually. And that's STD, Sexually Transmitted Demons. You get this book first, you read it. It's a sh short, quick, easy read. And then you go to college. <laughs> you go to college with the, the big book, uh, The Spirits of Sexual Perversion Reference Book. And this, is, this book is... Um, almost 300 pages. It's maybe about 280 pages. It's something that you want to digest very slowly, reading maybe five to 10 pages a day, taking a lot of notes. This is a great book for a study group, a deliverance group. It is essential for anybody that is married, anybody that wants to get married. If you're engaged right now and uh, you're moving toward that, you want to read and study this book thoroughly before you walk down that aisle. This book can save you from divorce, I promise you. Uh, if you and your spouse-to-be uh, read this book and apply the principles to make sure that you are thoroughly delivered before you get married, you should have a seamless, carefree marriage in terms of any sexual issues in the marriage with adultery and anything like that. So you definitely want to have this book if you're already married, if you're going to get married. There's a dedicated chapter in the book that talks about marital sex. There are a lot of questions about that, and I really delve into it in the book. Uh, talk about 11 different spirits of, of sexual perversion in the book, uh, fornication, masturbation, adultery, incest, homosexuality, prostitution, pornography, molestation, bestiality, sexual lust, and promiscuity. Of course, incubus and succubus is discussed. We've been reading out of it this entire time. I discuss intersexuals and their intimacy. Why did God make sex? Why did he do that to us? <laughs> you know, you're going to find that out in this book. But, but the best part about the book is you know, it's not just studying about sexual demons, but what the book really does is it opens up your intimacy with the Father. When you really understand why why Satan introduced sexual perversion uh, to the earth, it was to destroy our intimate worship with Yahweh, the Creator. And when you read this book and you really begin to understand what has happened in your life, it returns you to that place of pure intimacy with him, with yourself, and with your loved ones. And it is it is really going to enrich your worship. It is going to enrich your self-perception and your love for yourself and really, really enrich your relationship with your family and your friends and your loved ones. And if you are married, you are, uh, I can say this, you, you will begin to have the best, most passionate sex of your, of your married life after reading this book when you really begin to understand what intimacy really is and how to use it. So it's really important because this deliverance that you're going through right now or that you're going to help somebody go through, it is a process. 
and the transformation that happens with the renewing of the mind is essential. It is very, very important. Uh, and so I implore you to order this book. Get this book because if you don't get it and read it, you may change for a little while, but you might not experience that transformation that's going to give you that complete ultimate deliverance that you're looking for. And I'm not saying in any egotistical way that this is the only way that you can get delivered. I read a wonderful testimony from you from uh, a lady named Marie on one of the previous segments. She experienced complete and total deliverance and she never read my books. So God bless Marie that she was able to do that. But you know, this is a shortcut because I went through this for years and years and years and I wasn't able to get the help that I needed. People didn't have the knowledge to share with me. They they didn't know how to give me guidance and direction. So did I eventually get delivered? I did. I did. As I wrote this book and I got this revelation, I did eventually experience that complete deliverance. Marie did as well. But mind you, it took her over a decade. She said all throughout her teens and her 20s and into her 30s, look how long it took. Guys, this is your shortcut. This is a shortcut for you. It doesn't have to take 10 years or 15 years or 20 years or 5 years. It doesn't even have to take a year. I mean, by getting these two books and just really studying them, I really encourage you to study in a group, a study group or a cell group at your church with your girlfriends, with your, your guy friends, your spouse, your neighbors. Get together in a group and really study this book. This is your shortcut. This is your shortcut to complete and total, ultimate, utter deliverance from every spirit of sexual perversion that is afflicting you, along with the Bible. And there are, there are hundreds upon hundreds of Bible references in this book. So you'll be able to study the Bible along with the book because you can't replace the Bible with any book. No book replaces the Bible. But you'll be able to study the Bible along with this book and get such a thorough and complete uh, deliverance. So this is your shortcut. If I had this, even as I was watching back on one of the segments, uh, the last one that I did, I started laughing. And I said, where was this teaching when I needed to get delivered? Where was I? Um, but yeah, this, this, this is what I was looking for. This is what I, this is what I was looking for. And I can only give you a little bit of it uh, here on YouTube in this platform. You can get the book and you can devour it for yourself and get the complete study. So you can get these two books on my website, um, drintimacy.com, D-R-I-N-T-I-M-A-C-Y.com. The books are out of stock. They sell out quickly. However, they will be back in stock in a couple of weeks. What you want to do is when you go to the website, you're going to see the book link there and you can buy gift certificates uh, so that you can come back to the website and, and uh, use the gift certificate to purchase the book when it comes back in stock. Why do you want to do that? So that you can be sure to get one of the copies when it comes in. These books are printed in very short runs, only a hundred uh, books at a time or so, and they are usually gone within a couple of weeks. They're, they're gone. So if you buy the gift certificate, what I'm going to do, I'm going to guarantee and ensure that you get one of those printed books because you will be notified before the rest of the public is notified that the books are available. I'm actually going to personally email you and say, hey, the book is going to be out next week. And uh, you can use your gift certificate to put your order in right now. So anybody that buys a gift certificate, you're going to have that privilege uh, to know before everybody else knows. And also, the more gift certificates that are purchased, the more quickly I can restock the book and I can print more so that they won't run out so quickly. And if this has been a blessing to you, that will really be a blessing to me, just helping out with that because it has been hard. And, uh, and, and it really would be a blessing to me if you can help finance reprinting re these books by buying those gift certificates. But the important thing is that this is an important part of your deliverance process. So that is step six.
my time is up for this segment. We got uh, two more steps to go in the deliverance process. Uh, I've been I've been so excited to have you here doing this. Um, and so come on back. Insights from Doctor Intimacy YouTube webcast. Come back to the next uh, segment so that I can continue to share with you. Share this on your social media sites so that other people can be blessed. Thanks so much. How do sexual addictions develop? Let's go through this. Number one, let's just talk about sexual arousal. I think we all know about that. I don't have to go into detail. You know why? Because we're created with it. We're created with the concept. It is to be a good thing. It is to be a, a natural thing. Sexual arousal that will one day be involved in relationships with one individual and the love and the feeling and the mind-brain chemistry and the soul and everything about it, it's all to be good. As a matter of fact, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you know what it says? Verse 3, It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Now that word has the idea of by the dynamic power of the Spirit of God to become more and more Christ-like, to be more and more embedded with God's grace, mercy, truth, to grow in the knowledge of God, and to begin to bear His image again. So it is God's will for you to be sanctified. That's a powerful, good, dynamic thing for those who are believers. The Spirit of God goes on to say this, that you should avoid, the Greek word, strong, abstain. Move far away from one thing so you can move far into something else. The idea of abstaining here means you've got to let go of something and walk away from it and embrace something else and walk towards it. Here's what it says, that you should avoid, walk away from, in a big way, sexual immorality. You know what the Greek word? Porneus. Just like the demon that is called Porneus in Ephesians 6, that you should walk away from, that you should abstain from, that you should uh, burn the bridges and uh, walk far away from sexual Porneus. Whatever form. All kinds of sexual deviations and uh, addictions and dysfunctions and perversions. Walk away from it. God doesn't say walk away from sex. Walk away from the perneus, sexual perneus. He didn't say deny your sexual feelings. You can't. You've been created with them. Arousal all the way to the point of sexual satisfaction with your, your uh, married partner. I mean, that is what God, God gave us that for pleasure. There's great power in that, great joy in that. But like everything else, a fallen world system, the sin code nature inside, and Satan himself loved to exploit and misuse and destroy. And look at verse 4. That each one of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Learn that. It says in verse 5, Not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. I mean, again, if you don't know God and the Spirit of God is not inside of you, Romans 8, if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you are none of His. If you don't know God, the, the sin nature, this thing called the sarks, this presence because of the fall, it's linked to our own dying, our own mot mortality. It's in you. You read Romans 8. You do the study. I mean, if you're intelligent, go ahead and read Romans 8. Do the study. It's a presence operative in you because you and I, we've sinned. Psychology, you know, they can't get it out. Gene splicers can't splice it out. It's beyond the concept of biological determinism when it comes to the genes. There is a sin code within that is operative. It's called the law of sin and death. Romans 8 will tell you about another law, the law of the spirit of life, zoe, the quality, beauty, dynamic of the life that comes out of heaven in Christ. 
That's the bottom line. Our sexuality is not denied. Our arousal and our sexual pleasure with our married mate, that's not denied. That's embraced. That's the gift of God. That's the joy. We're simply not to use it in passionate lust in the destructive way that we see the world literally addicted. I mean, it always presents as something exciting to draw us in. I mean, that's what that's why temptation comes. That's why people who live in that sexually addictive lifestyle, that 65-year-old man, that 75-year-old man, both of whom are in jail right now, they knew how to try to entice children. They wanted to do it for their own sexual pleasure because you know what? They, on a high level of total perversion, are sexually addicted. Verse 6 in that same chapter says, and that in this manner no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. That nobody should go sinning and manipulating and tempting. If you're somebody out there that knows how to tempt others, knows how to use your sex to get what you want, to make money, to get what you want, to be, if you're the kind of person that can use it to exploit others, if all you care care about is your own sexual gratification, you're a You're an addict. Sin has you. Satan's got you, man. Verse 7, God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Now, I want you to hear me today. Let conviction fall. That's a good thing, to break through the strength of sin and its arrogance. May God break through. But we have no stones to throw. But we do have mercy to talk about. We do have grace We do have Jesus to talk about the sin bearer of the world, your sin bearer. You're not going to get rid of your addiction any other way, really. I mean, you could do some things. You can be locked up. Is that what you really want? Don't you want it out of you? Don't you want your life to be changed? I mentioned this as the normal thing, the good thing, but then arousal, I want you to realize the feelings behind it. What arouses a man? What brings arousal to a woman? What then the dark side knows how to tempt that. The sin nature knows how to manipulate that and use that and tempt that. Wearing the kind of clothing, uh, talking the certain talk, um, enticing, uh, suggesting, uh, um, doing what it takes to try to uh, bring about the arousal in others so as to bring them into the sexual act. See, behind arousal involves also chemistry inside of us. I mean, once that starts, all the chemicals begin to move, and uh, it's all tied to the brain, the mind. It's all tied within Is it automatic? I mean, if you start to get aroused, can you walk away? Yes, you can walk away. If you see something on television, see something on the beach, if you hear something in a song, if you read something in a book, ladies, if all of a sudden you're getting sexually aroused, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that which arouses you in the wrong way? Because you know the fallen world system, the flesh nature and others, And even the devil himself, there's going to be the drive to tempt. You ever read in James, each man, each person is tempted. When by his own, listen, evil desire, not the right kind of desire, not the right kind of sexual arousal that leads to joy and blessing and everything that's involved with your married spouse. No, this involves just simply sheer sin nature, desire, to tempt you. Now, each man is tempted when by that evil desire. Listen, it talks about you being enticed and then dragged away. It's a process. It involves then the development of feelings on the inside. Now, I want you to hear me when I say point number three, the story of the duct tape. So I'm at a conference in the Akron area. The doc is up there teaching and It's on the subject of uh, healthy sexuality. 
So the, the, the professor walks over with a piece of duct tape, grabs a man's arm, and puts the duct tape on the man's arm, of course, covering the hair on his arm and everything else. And um, he smiles. He's done this before. The guy then slowly has to peel the duct tape. I mean, the duct tape is sticky, and now he's pulling the duct tape off, and, of course, he's going to pull some of his arm hairs out and everything else. The professor then takes the duct tape that has just been pulled off that man and slaps it on the arm of another man. Well, that man has to take it off, but it's not as sticky. And then he tells that man to put it on that woman's arm, and it's on hers, And she goes to peel it off, and it's not that sticky. And then to the next, eventually, the duct tape can be slapped on any arm and barely connect. He associated that with anybody's first sexual experience. It is supposed to be that when we have our first real sexual experience with the spouse that God has given us, that we have engaged for life, that that is to be yada, the intimate engagement of body, of soul, of love. It is sacred. All the feelings, pleasure, it's all to be there. And when the climax comes and when the the goal of that sexual arousal comes about, there's all of a sudden a mind-brain chemistry that is inseparably connected to the love that you have for that person. It embeds. It imprints. And it's as if your body says, I want that again. So as you want your spouse again and again and again and again. And as, um, and as married spouses that love one another, and let me just tell you something, um, biblically, the arousal, the sex, all of it, you should realize biblically it is all absolutely Good. There's a book out there called Intended for Pleasure. I believe it was written by Christians. Gosh, I read that probably 30 years ago. You see, if all of a sudden you just go out in a teenager, you have sex, you have sex with somebody else again and again, and somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. And somebody else. I mean, there's gays that have sex with uh, 10, 20, 100, 200 other partners. It only becomes the sexual, chemical, self-pleasuring. It's all about just that pleasure principle. It's all about like, I mean, really, it's no different from the meth head, the heroin addict, the crackhead. I mean, the idea, you know what some guy told me one time? He said he was free from crack, cocaine and all the rest. You know what he told me one day? He said, Russ, even though I'm free and I don't do cocaine any longer, if I see somebody take out white powder like flour, pour it out on the counter, begin to use it. He says, I begin to salivate. It's as if my body, once I recognize and look at that powder, I began to learn what that powder would do to me. Like the meth head, everybody else, they know what the drug will do. That's why they'll steal. They'll sell their body. They'll do anything to get, they'll give up their kids because they want that feeling. Some people will do anything for that sexual feeling. Some people will steal, cheat, rape. I mean, this is where incest comes into the, pl- the picture. This is where, um, you know, if somebody has been taken by a family member and sexual things were done and the arousal was there and you felt the sexual feelings, you know it's wrong, you know it's weird, you know it's unnatural, but uh, the sexual feelings are there. That's true concerning the necromantic ritual, those that practice sex with the dead. All the feelings are there, the arousal the feelings, the sexual climaxes, all of that is there. And it all brings about the chemical response and embeds to where your body wants again and again and again and again and again. It's embedded in the wrong way. It's imprinted in the wrong way. To where finally, whether arousal was brought about in the middle of rape, incest, testing, experimentation, peer pressure, the push, even when you know you didn't want to do it, but someone said, if you love me, you will. Someone said, if, you'll, if you want me, if you want me to be with you, you're going to have to do it. And, and some girls, some guys will give their sexual lives away, give sexual favors away just to move up in places. I mean, that's true. Everybody knows that. Sex sells. Sex has power. Sex can gain access. 
Along with that, the sexual experimentation. And again, once you do it and do it again and do it again and do it again because the arousal climax factor is there, the chemical um, embed and release is there and the embed is, is, is you know there, then you're driven. That's why some people can see something. I mean, how could it be that somebody would be sexually excited looking at a dead corpse? Uh, it's, it's so far beyond me. Sexually excited to look at a little child. So far beyond, I, I, you, you and I would think, but if somebody being led by the sin nature, by porneus, dark, wicked, unclean spirits, to misuse, we can all recognize that sex can be misused. Human trafficking, fight it. Satanic ritual abuse, fight it. Pedophilia and, and uh, child sexual abuse, fight it. The issue is point seven on the notes. The I mentioned this yesterday, Romans, and, and you and I need to do a study because in secular psychology they cannot give you this. See the what is what is inside the, the construct? I mean, what's inside of us? Fallen humans, we have an operative law of sin and death. Unless as we'll talk and really bring this out, we're going to really help you with how to break free, how to have permanent freedom, how to help bring others out. Can you find freedom? Can you break away? Can you get out of that the pattern of um, sin, addicted, arousal, climax, sell anything, do anything, spend all your money, spend your life. You'll go past the guilt. You'll go past everything. You'll walk away from God. Sin nature is involved. Dark spirits, without question, can be involved in the temptation. Especially now with the so-called sleep paralysis, astral sex, shamans, and so many in the world of the New Age and the in occultism teaching vast new levels of sexual arousal climax that involves the chemical imprint and drives a person to find the same again and again and again. Whatever the cost, tired, guilty, shame, secret life. Someone screams out, why do I have these um, sexual feelings? Let me me say this, because a gay man was complaining, why did God give me sexual feelings for men if God also doesn't want me to have sex with them? First of all, let's make it very clear. God did not give you sexual desire for men. God did not give sexual desire for dead corpses. God did not give sexual desire for animals, for demon spirits, or for children. That comes from the sin nature. That comes from demon spirits that guide in that transmutation of the gift of sex. As we're listening, so many of you by just simply... I mean, some of you will know people. Some of you will think about your own children or your spouse. Others about society. But many of you listening about yourself. Is there deep healing by the living Savior Christ because you've been ruined by others? Yes. Is there such a cleansing that He can bring in such a new life in the presence of His Spirit and a feeling of freedom and holiness and life and love? Yes. Is there a way to take sex out of the central preoccupation of life and bring it back to being part of life? Yes. Is there a way to... Now listen carefully. What if you don't get to have sex, arousal, climax, imprint? You know what, you know what temptation does? You know what the enemy does? It almost uh, sin, The sin nature and the enemy is really the same in their, their goal. You know what the lie is? If you don't have sexual arousal and climax, um, you have to. No, you don't. You're going to die if you don't have... No, you're not going to die. Um, the parts of your body are going to fall off. No, that's not true either. You're not going to die. You're not going to go crazy. What you need to learn is 
what drives your sexual addiction? What happened to you in the past? How you've given over your life to the world, to the flesh, and even to the devil. The imprint, the cycle that you've gotten yourself into or somebody led you into. I want you to hear what I'm saying. Nobody stands here as a religious nut with stones in the hand to throw and condemn. I love the scripture that says in John 3, 17, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but rather to save. Saving power is forgiveness, washing, cleansing, renewal, power to begin to walk habitually in the right way. And your feelings and your system of chemistry inside Everything can be changed from the inside out when Christ comes inside. Do you know him? He's waiting. Turn to him. As a believer, we'll talk about this. Burn the bridges. Walk away. Look at some of the scripture I gave you today. Russ Dizdar, we're at the end of the hour. Remember us in prayer. Please now, think about it. Remember us also in support. God bless. There I was standing in front of the building. Now, I was told, this is what I was told, I was told that uh, the mom and dad told me that the daughter had been taken by a pimp and um, was being forced to dance in uh, one of those uh, clubs in the inner city. He, that uh, The pimp had punched her in the face and was uh, forcing her to do things. It kind of outraged us, and uh, so a couple of the brothers um, and I, we went down to Lisa's Cabaret there in Akron and uh, knocked on the door of the dancer bar, asked about seeing the manager. They wouldn't at first allow that. So we got in. I mean, we did get in. And there to my left was a uh, black girl. She was a dancer dressed in her bikini at the time and a big old bouncer with a choker chain around his neck. I s stood there at the bar looking at one of the men saying, I need to talk to your your manager, because I had already called the Akron Vice Squad, told them what was going on, asked them to come down. As I stood there waiting for the manager to come, I looked over at the bouncer, and the bouncer um, was looking at me with one of those mean, ferocious, I'm going to kill you ki kind of looks. Well, inside I'm praying. I looked over at him. The Spirit of God gave me some insight. I just opened my mouth and said to him, You're not supposed to be here. This isn't God's plan for your life. You have a background in church. And I think you gave your life to the Lord, but now you stand here backslidden. The man was undone. He smiled with guilt-ridden face, disarmed, then the manager showed up. I told the manager about the girl. She's only uh, 17, and you're breaking the law. And the pimp punched her. And I, I'm telling him all this stuff. The um, one black dancer comes over and says, Hi, honey, do you want to come over here? I'll show you what the club's all about. So I looked at her politely but sternly said, I am not here for that. As uh, we waited a little longer, there was another dancer that came by, sat down in a chair, of course with a bikini on. I just looked at her. They called her Angel. And I said, um, what are you doing in here? Is, is this where you really want to be? Pull out a gospel track, put my phone number on it and handed it to her. Told her that we would get her out of there if she wants to leave right now. Manager said, get out of the building. So we stood on the outside of the building next to our motorcycles. And there on the outside, while we're waiting for the vice squad to show up, there were some pimps and drug dealers that came by the side door. There were men in their 50s and 60s pulling up in the Lexus and into the, you know, in their really nice cars. They're pulling up. I'm watching this. 
I'm watching as they're getting out of their car, going in, paying a little money for a dance, laptop dance, whatever they want to call it, and then they go next door into the porn shop. I mean, this is a dark, a very dark, seedy side. We're out in a parking lot. Don't know if we're going to get shot. What's going to happen? We're waiting. The pimp begins to argue with me. I begin to ask him about the girl and tell him that Akron, you know, the vice squad, I begin to share the gospel. He's angry. He's arrogant. This is his livelihood. We need to get out of there, he says. We're ruining his livelihood. The bouncer and the other guys come out and says, guys, you're going to have to leave the property. You're uh, bad for business. Hallelujah. One of the other brothers uh, from the church came down, and he was in the middle of the parking lot just getting there. A, a guy came in, about 30 years old, in a big old truck, and he stopped and talked to my friend and said, Hey, what's going on tonight? Who's dancing tonight? My friend looked at him and says, You know what? I don't know who's dancing tonight, but I've got something for you. And began to share the gospel and gave him a gospel track. The man said, Thank you, man. My wife's out of town and I came down here to mess around and uh, thank you for stopping me. And he drove off. I thought, what a tremendous place if we could go out on the street, the uh, sidewalk area, set up a tent and just open house ministry for all these sex addicts, the drugs, the alcohol, the crime, all the stuff going on. Some of our teams had gone down there and walked around the place praying and praying and uh let me tell you something, the seediness, the uh, the smelly, the dark, the dirty, the it's all there, the drugs, and, and the pimps, they make me sick. Hey, this is Russ Dizdar, Shatters Live broadcast on this Tuesday night, May 15th, halfway through the month of May 2012, three days away, the conference in Warren, Ohio, Fingerprints of the Supernatural Rise of Radical Evil Conference, Vienna Assembly of God, it's all on the website, shadowthedarkness.net. So three days away, now they tell me there's over a hundred uh, there. The lunchtime for Saturday is already booked out, and uh, Ellie Marzulli's coming in on Friday. I'll be up there on Friday. We'll have our books out, our materials out, ready for ministry. We have a feeling there's going to be some infiltration into this conference this weekend. And then we're going to be home for about four or five days, then head off for Huttonsville, West Virginia. Pastor Butch Paul, Dr. Eric Benson, L.A. Marzulli, and myself. Down there in West Virginia, we're going to do a three-day conference in a very beautiful, beautiful uh, campgrounds, almost like a resort. Hope you're going to come here locally. Hope you're going to come down to the West Virginia conference Checkmate, that one's called. Then, if you want to, Chicago, the Chicago Summit. And um, that's going to probably book out pretty qu- pretty quickly. So we hope that you'll come there towards, um, well, right after the half of the month, Chicago Summit. Glad you're um, here with us today. Welcome to all those listening by satellite, by internet, by the iPads and iPhones and CB Channel 19, all the rest. By the archives the world over, blessings in the name of Christ, Jesu Christu. May His grace be stretched out today to save, heal, deliver, and show extraordinary miracle in this hour. May God do that in the name of Jesus. May God show enormous healing and um, the power to set free from the addictions that are behind um, the sexual decadence. You know, we titled this Sexual Decadence in the End of Man because the sexual decadence side of things, as prophesied in Scripture, will become a global binding point. It'll be a global binding point inseparable from demonic worship. And um, it'll be that which binds hundreds of millions in their life in opposition. I'm going to say this, arrogant opposition of God. In the future, if you don't get out now, let me tell you what, in the future, it's harder. It's harder when you're deeper into sin and deeper embracing the dark side and it embracing you. What would it profit if a man gains the whole world? 
and lose his very soul. Did you know you can lose it? Did you know you could be separated? You Listen, if you think you don't know God now, and this life's kind of crazy now, it is appointed unto man once to die. It's destined unto man once to die. After that, the judgment. If you're lost and the sin nature's there and Satan has rights and you don't have God and death is operative inside, you are hell bound. But arisen from the dead and here today, a Savior who's come for you. You are listening by the providence of God and by the draw and work and conviction of the Spirit of God. May that conviction, which is sheer grace, pull you out of the darkness and bring you to the cleansing, freeing Savior that loves you. Have you, have you come to Christ? Do you know Him? Hey, we're talking about here on May 15th, Sexual decadence, how sexual addictions occur, the ignorance, the doorways, the temptation, the practice, the dark side agenda, all the rest, the biological, the physiological, the chemical side of it all. Two major points tonight, the reality of addiction, and then how sexual addiction develops. Now, the web notes, you can get those off the shatterthedarkness.net site, just where it says broadcast outline notes. And I put up the extra quotes tonight also. Let me quote you one thing here. Get, let me give you a report quickly. Yesterday I told you about here locally, a 75-year-old man, I heard more about the story today, 75-year-old man, he'd already, he, he was already wanted for sexual enticement of children. They pulled him over, he had a gun in the car, loaded, he had Barbie dolls that he used to entice little girls. 75-year-old sexual addict pervert now in jail. And then today I hear about the other guy. 65 years old, enticed a child in the neighborhood over to his house for sex. Have you ever read in Proverbs... When it comes down to sexual arousal, sexual temptation, sexual drawl, have you read this, Proverbs 5? My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen well to my words of insight. That you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of the adulteress drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths are crooked, but she knows it not. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Listen now carefully. For those addicted in any level sexually, preoccupied any level sexually, listen to verse 9. Lest you give your best strength to others and your years to one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich another man's house. At the end of your life, you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. You will say how I hated discipline, how my heart spurned correction. You want to waste your life. In this urgent last hour of human history, that's your choice. It's stupid. We're nuts if we're sucked into the world system, drawn by the old flesh. You know what the flesh nature, do you know what it is? I want to tell you about that tonight in this context of, um, well, two points tonight. The reality of addiction and then how sexual addiction develops. So to all the sex addicts out there, let's, um, let's open the windows and see the raw truth. And let me tell you right now, there's incredible hope. May God's conviction come. May His mercy strike. 
Let me tell you this, when the woman who was caught in adultery in Scripture, you ever read this Gospel of John, caught in the act? I mean, in the Scriptures, there's prostitutes. In the Scriptures, there are those who are selling them and using them. There are those who are enticing and drawing people in to make the money, you know, the buck. She's caught in adultery. And um, again, here's where you can see the difference between Christ and fake religious, I mean, just man-made religious junk. Here's the Pharisees standing there with stones. They caught her. See, they're out there looking for it. They're all dressed up, haircuts and everything else. They're all looking in a certain direction, and um, they're um, kind of tagged as uh, the religious Joes of the day. And so they um, they catch the woman. How'd they catch her? I don't know. Did they go after her? Did they find It's like they snoop to find it. Self-righteous. Unsaved. Undelivered themselves. But they've got stones. You know what man-made religion does? It stands there in front of you with stones to consume you, to destroy you. There's no sense of how this woman get there, what happened to her, why is she doing this, and um, zero mercy in man-made cold, hard religion. No deliverance there, no salvation there, no healing there, no freedom there, no mercy there. Look who stands in between the religious nuts and uh, the sin-packed woman. Christ. Jesu Christu. Now we have um, God in human flesh. You want to see how he deals with it? There he is riding in the sand. I don't know what it is. People have speculated. You who have cast, you know, you have not sinned, cast the first stone. The wisdom of Christ just, I mean, it just blows them out of the water. Thud to the ground, thud to the ground, thud to the ground go the stones. And the religious, self-made, self-righteous men walk away with their own sin. So blinded, they just simply walk away. See, you can listen to this and uh, be blinded by everything and just listen and walk away your sin intact. It's not good enough just to feel guilty or just to realize you're in the wrong. God calls you out of it to put you in the right. God desires and has made the way for you to be right with God cleansed and know it. Jesus asks the uh, sinning, adulterous woman, you know, she's into it, and where are your, where are your, you know, accusers? They've all gone. Now she's just face to face with God in human flesh. I wonder what this woman caught in adultery Is the guilt there, the shame there, the dirtiness there? What's there? Does God in human flesh spit on her? Write her a letter and say, look how stupid and guilty you are. What does he do? What does God do? He totally forgives And he tells her, go, but don't do this any longer. Don't sin any longer. You know what sin is? In every single case, every kind of sin, no matter what it is, it's always touching the hot burner. We always get burnt. It always moves us from God. It brings the wall between us and God. And it brings the um, junk of this world and, and what sin's results. I mean, we reap what we sow, do we not? Let me start here. The reality of addiction. The world is really out of control when it comes down to this. I mean, I can uh, I can uh, read the uh, reports. I can read the materials. Let me read one right now when it comes down to addiction. This is what um, Patrick Carnes says in his book, Out of the Shadows. 
Sex addicts, and I'm quoting here, addicts progressively go through stages in which they retreat further from reality of friends, family, and work. Their secret lives become more real than their public lives. What other people know is a false identity. Only the individual addict knows the shame of living a double life. The real world and the addict's world leading a fantasy double life is a distortion of reality. That's from Patrick Carnes' the book, good book, Out of the Shadows. Out of control? I mean, think about it when it comes down to the net. Think about it when it comes down to prostitution and the dancers. Think about all of that. The guys that go and, you know, unleash the dollars and the monies and to see the dance and to see the, la- you know, see it all. And don't forget, ladies, that it turns the other way around, too, when Chip and Dale come to town, right? You see, sexual addiction goes both ways. And um, the world, fallen world, the sarks, the sin nature, that that principle operative in us when we're lost and the ability of it to tempt us tempt us when we're when we're saved and don't forget the dark side i mentioned it yesterday dark side spirits titled porneus penumenicae ephesians 6 i mean they are out specifically to traffic in sexual addiction Dark side operatives know that um, it dirties the conscience, dirties the construct of a human, and eventually helps open the door to demonization and possession. That's why Satanists have sex rituals, sex magic, tantra, kundalini, and all the rest. Because the spirits guide because they want to preoccupy and um, they want to embed. They want lives to be transmuted. They want to manipulate and exploit what God has created as good, turn it around and exploit it for their use. Are you going to sit there and let them do that? Are you going to sit there and let sin, the world system around us? Give me a break. Downtown Akron. That, uh, that cabaret down there that draws in all those people, including the drug addicts and the sex that sells to make the money to get the drug that eventually turns the girl and the guy, the meth heads, I mean, there's so many times they look like they're 100 years old. There's a price to pay. There's a cost in all of this. Why give your strength to another? Why surrender your life? Do you really want to surrender it to an out-of-control world? Now, there's things you won't do. There's things you listening right now you will not do. Whether you're in India or Pakistan, Russia or China, whether you're in Brazil or Kenya, whether you're in London or Berlin or Amsterdam or Manila, it makes no difference. The fallen world system guided and led by folks that are just absolutely consumed by the sin nature and Satan's work. It's prophetic that with the manifestation of dark side presence comes deeper entrenchment and the embedding of sexual addiction. And let me tell you something, sexual addiction in some makes some people arrogant it makes some people arrogant and argue for their lifestyle, and they'll make fun of you. They'll, they're going to rip you up because you don't do what they do. Can I read you something? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he, because he who suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for earthly, listen, for evil human desires, rather. You see that little phrase, evil human lusts. The idea, the Greek word there is in reference to the dark side, not just desire, but evil desire. There's a difference between healthy desire and evil desire. 
You can live for the evil desires you reap what you sow, or you can live for the will of God that is perfect, pleasing, and good. Verse 3 tells us this, For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. If you have walked away from all of that, make it clear and clean, burn the bridges. Verse 4, they think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood, this this gripping, um, transmuting flood of dissipation. They heap abuse on you. Now, I want to tell you right now, there are, there are those in the porn industry, prostitution, pimps, and the gay activists all across the board, the hedonists and the clubs, they can be arrogant, they can have, they can have uh, protests, they can uh, write signs, they can go to lobbyists. I mean, N- Nambola lobbies and has lobbied in the United States. They've lobbied with a slogan, sex before eight is too late. Have you heard that? When you look all around us right now, when you think in terms out of control, Out of control, the sex porn industry, let me quote, pornography and the fabric of culture, it should come as no surprise to anyone that pornography is big business. I'm quoting now from William Struthers' book titled Wired for Intimacy, subtitled How Pornography Hijacks the Male Brain. He goes on to say this, quote, The estimated financial size of the worldwide sex industry is around $57 billion. With $12 billion, just over 20% coming from the United States. $12 billion. While adult videos constitute the bulk of the porn industry, its tentacles are in many other media as well. Magazines, escort services, strip clubs, phone sex, pay-per-view channels. From the book, Wired for Intimacy. I'm reading another note here concerning um, Hefner. Playboy, you know Hefner. I'm reading the the quote from um, Patrick Carnes, Out of the Shadows. Here's what it says. Hefner was approaching 45, and he had been involved with hundreds of photogenic women since starting his magazine. He enjoyed female companionship now more than ever. I'm not going to read all that it says except the very end. Quote and unquote, here it is. He, Hefner, Hugh Hefner, was a sex junkie with an insatiable habit, says Gay Tally's The Neighbor's Wife, out of the book The Neighbor's Wife. He was a sex junkie with an insatiable habit. So whether you think in terms of the entire world of porn, now you got to realize something, satanic ritual abuse, thousands upon thousands of victims worldwide that have said that they've been used by their handlers, by their leaders and coven leaders, in sex acts that would then be videotaped to be selling for their... Their agenda. Who makes the billions and billions and billions of dollars? What about the pimps? And if anybody makes you sick, it's the pimps who punch their women, harm their women, enslave their women, put the kids in the in the little cages, lock them down. I mean, the sex trade pimps around the world. When God's righteous judgment falls and they are scarfed off to hell permanently, thank God. Prostitution. You know, I've sat down and talked to a prostitute. I've talked to pimps. I've talked to those who've come to the office with the different problems, and that's gays, and that's men and women committing adultery, and that's those. One girl comes to me years and years and years ago. You know what she says? She's pregnant. You know what she says? It just happened. (laughs) I looked at her and I said, it just happened, huh? See, the mother was angry because it was going to embarrass the family. She only counseled and demanded one thing, that her daughter have an abortion. 
kill the baby, get rid of the baby. Don't worry. I mean, the issue is the sexual issue, sin, the... Even the guilt, shame, and dealing with the daughter, that wasn't the issue for the mom. The mom only wanted one thing. Get rid of the baby. Don't let anybody in the neighborhood or family know. Let's push this. I mean, let's abort the baby and, and, and brush it all off. Abortions. Killing Tens of millions of babies in the last 40, 50 years. I mean, Russia, you're doing it. China, you're doing it. All over the world, you're doing it. Jesus called the baby inside the womb, the fetus. Jesus called the baby brephos. That's the Greek word meaning a living human being. 95% of all abortions are for convenience. It comes down to point five, sexual hedonism. Maybe the guys should listen. Maybe the girls should listen. I want to tell you right now, when we've done ministry to biker bars and on the streets and around those places, and man, we've gone right up to gay bars and witnessed to folks and to other places and to all the dance places for years. The arrogant hedonism, the self-gratifying, I only want sexual feelings and gratification for myself. So I don't care what I got to tell the girl. I don't care what I got to tell the guy. See, some girls will do it again and again and again only because they want to be with somebody. So sex becomes part of that. I will reward you if you show me some kind of companionship. Though they don't get what they want. Not from a self-gratifying, selfishly living into you know male not at all i mean when you think of hedonism the um the um you know the islands the parties the sex orgies all the rest that which i just read about there in the book of first peter chapter 4 college campuses right now i mean it's just amazing isn't it I mean, we've done college campus evangelism Akron University Kent State University We were up at Yale a few weeks ago, and on that weekend, again, everybody's out partying around, wanting to do the stuff, and, um, well, yeah, experimentation and uh, exploitation, everybody's doing it, peer pressure, you'll have sex with me if you love me, is what someone says, liar. And see, all the time while I'm speaking right now, there are so many listening, you've been bitten, you've been hurt, you've been burned, you've been desecrated you've been i mean we can talk about incest rape we can talk about all the rest we've got 10 points we're going to share with you tonight on the area of sexual addiction i'm just giving you the reality of addictions that are out there i mean think about the occult sexual addiction sex rituals that are set up for just sexual practices and uh, usually the using of girls and women sex magic I mean, in the whole world, the necromantic ritual book, the whole arena, to listen to a woman talk about how these quote-unquote uh, spiritually sacred arousal and feelings come about as they approach the dead corpse to have sex with it. Oh, that's right. You see, someone says, if it feels good, just do it. And that's what they say in bestiality, in necrophilia, and in pedophilia. I mean, people steal money from other people because that gives them something. I mean, there are those who sell drugs and ruin other people's lives because that gives them something. There are pimps that don't do what the prostitutes do, but they force the prostitute, trick the prostitute, enslave the prostitute, manipulate the prostitute, they exploit both men and girls for their own profit. So when I say um, take a look at all these fields, uh, look at look at um, look at the industry, look at the advertisements, look at the little girls put up on stage. Sex, well, follow the money. Doesn't marketing know? Don't they understand? Don't they realize? 
that there are things that they can put into their ads that will bring an enticement, that will draw attention, some for women, some for men. Even gay ads. So it sells, it costs, it burns, and it drags so many millions into the depths of the sin nature, to the edge of hell itself. Some wonder how they're going to get out of it. They wonder if their lives will ever change. They feel already they messed up. They, they have done stuff so many times that it doesn't matter anymore. They're just ruined. We're all ruined. For all have sinned, harmatia. We've all fallen short. We've all missed the mark. We've all sinned. Fallen short of the glory of God. That's what happens in a fallen world. That's what happens when sin is the uh, operative principle in life that drives us in opposition to God and all that we were created to be and do. It moves humanity to go against all of nature, created uh, nature, biologically, physiologically. We know there are things that are very true in the world of sexuality. I mean, nobody wants to talk about that. I mean, it's like the thought control police are here right now in the United States, other parts of the world they've already won over to say, don't bring it up, don't acknowledge biologically and physiologically certain sexual addictions. They are just completely uh, unnatural. They're wrong. Many of you listening right now, you would say, yeah, sex with the dead, sex with the animal, sex um, with spirits. That's all unnatural. That's all wrong. I mean, those, you know what I did? I'm sitting at a restaurant, a satanic, ritually abused, chosen one sitting across from me. A professor comes in from the university. He begins to explain his life in the world of the occult and what he got himself into and the spiritual engagement with a demon that was leading him into sexuality. He began to explain in detail the sexual feelings. I had to stop him because I was... I was, it, it, it repulsed me. The pornography coming out of his lips. He was consumed. Did he go through deliverance? Yeah. Was there a spirit there? Yes. Was he delivered? Yes. Did it take us some time because of his embrace and because of the sexual body chemical you know, mind-brain reaction to sexual arousal and climax and demonization? Yes. You want to step into the deep waters? You want to burn yourself badly? Well, there is a Savior. There is a healer. It's not that you didn't pay the cost or are not going to pay the cost. Walking away from just eliminating babies and killing them, aborting them because it's not convenient. I mean, just walking away from children that you didn't want to have and go on with your hedonistic, self-oriented life. I mean, there are people that just want to stay away. They've been raped. They've been, uh, they've been in, in their own family, incest. And let's talk about this. Let's talk about how sexual addictions develop. I'm going to go through 10 of those. Now, you could read the books. You know what I did on the notes? I um, added a page right after the page three of today's notes. I added a page. There's a book called Not In Our Genes. There's another book, Biblical Guide to Counseling the Sex Addict. Another book called The God of Sex. Another one called The Homosexuality and the Politics of Truth. There's two... Um, there's two links up there also. Pure Life Ministries, all about, um, that's all they do, dedicated in helping people out. And then there's Exodus International. Take a look at it. The untold story in America and around the world is that there are thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of gays, ex-gays, people that walked away, ex-porn, ex-prostitutes, ex, ex, ex. Jesus truly does, and only God can give an absolutely new start, new life. So I'm standing at the front of the church. I'm looking out. You wouldn't, um, you wouldn't think this. It's a nice day. I see a mother with her two boys. I see a, the father standing there. I mean, it's just an incredible look as I'm looking out over the congregation. 
This is the lady that came to me to say, Russ, Pastor Russ, when I was in college, I was a lesbian. I, I lived years as a lesbian. I didn't know that. Here she is, a mom, two children, a husband. She said, Russ, that's gave myself to when I was in college and uh, practiced it, realizing that it was wrong. I got out of it, walked away. I look in the same congregation, there's a man, I did the wedding, I did the wedding for him and his wife, and he was a ex-homosexual. That's where he once was with his life, that's what he once practiced with his, with his life. I, so I, I, I want you to hear this show today, that uh, incredible change, permanent change, complete change, joyful change can occur for all of us. Over to my right, here's what it says. California may ban gay teen conversion therapy. Sacramento, this is Sacramento, California. A first of its kind, banned on controversial form of psychotherapy aimed at making gay people straight is speeding through the California State House. Now, please understand something. This is being pushed by the gay lobby, the gay homosexual lobby. It says here, quote, this therapy can be dangerous, said the bill's author, Senator Ted Lewell. The tolerance Democrat added that the treatment can cause extreme depression, guilt, that sometimes leads to suicide. The other side of the story could also be said that... um, depression, guilt, everything else. I mean, what about those that want to get out? What about the thousands that do? So I'm looking at YouTube videos today, ex-lesbians, ex-homosexuals, listening to their stories. I've done this over 35 years in counsel in listening to stories. Now, I did sit on a bench one day. A girl had called. This is a young girl that uh, we administered to years prior. She called and said that she's in town She wanted to talk by the coffee shop at the bench. She explained to me that she became a lesbian. She asked me what I thought. She asked me what the Bible said. And when I told her what the Bible said concerning it, she became angry. I mean, she was red-faced, angry, got up, walked away, walked back, back and forth, very angry. So this is an issue where there's going to be that kind of um, interaction. There's there's folks out there that they're so alarmed by homosexuality and, and sexual um, sin in this area that they just want to throw stones and yell. And, and um, is that the answer? What about when it comes to adultery and sex before marriage and strippers and prostitution and porn and all the rest? I think, again, the words of Jesus, as we shared yesterday, when the religious crazies had stones in their hand, they're going to stone the woman caught in adultery, sexual sin. And there is God standing there in between the two, and mercy prevails. Tonight, as we talk about the arrogance of sexual addiction and um, what then drives a human being to want to change everything, change nature, conscience, society, psychology, history, biology, political ideology, laws, theology, to change God. So let's get into this tonight. This is Russ Dizdar Shatters Live Broadcast On this, the 16th of May, it's Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Glad that you're here by satellite, by the internet, by, well, the iPads and iPhones and truckers, CB19. By all the downloads around the world, welcome again as uh, we pray that God's mercy, God's grace, I love it, I love it in the book of James chapter 5. You know what it says about uh, mercy and judgment? You know what God says about it? That mercy triumphs over judgment. That God prefers mercy. That God prefers grace. That God prefers, I mean, even the patience of God in this world. 
Well, let's take a look tonight as we're looking into the series, Sexual Decadence and the End of Man. We do have a, a training course that was already out about 20-some hours, but I just noticed this week again some of those links are broke, so only some of those are available. But we have these five we're going to add, and uh, we'll fix that um, link uh, for all of those to be available because, well, we're hearing from individuals as we have done before. Now, I um, had somebody email me. I'm going to read this to you. And this is what it says. P.S. at the end of it. P.S. Feel free to read this on air if you like. So I appreciate the bold testimony and confession. The email that I got today, this morning, says these words. Hey, Russ. Quote, I'm enjoying your series on sexual decadence. I recently came to Christ mainly because or as a result of reading your book and listening to many hours of your podcasts. Thank you, brother. He goes on to say this. I was um, released from a lifelong addiction to sex and pornography. This addiction was very much tied up with drug addiction, which I've also been released from. I know full well how the demonic comes in through certain sexual practices. I won't go into detail here, but certain practices have a demonic charge to them, which is very addictive. I was enslaved to this for so long, and I found it incredibly draining. I also know that this, or the slippery slope that occurs when one wants to maintain a certain high it needs more and more perversity to do so. This dear friend ends his email with these words, and I'm quoting, Thank God I am now free. Now that's the kind of email that I hear from time to time from all over. This is, this is the stories that I hear of anybody from any kind of sexual addiction. Let me tell you this, drug addiction, sex addiction, gambling addiction, Addictions that com completely control a life. But now we need to hear the other side of this issue. The arrogance of justifying sexual addictions. That's what we're going to get into tonight. As we look, up, look at two primary things. Number one, the fight to clear the conscience. And number two, the power. The power of Jesus. Now somebody else wrote today, I want to... And I, and I wrote them back already and told them that I may bring up their information. They said, okay, no names. Once again, that's how we do it. No names when we do bring this out. But they're telling us here. They begin their email concerning the series on sexual decadence and the end of man. It says this, I hate this week, LOL. Seriously, though, too many bad memories for me. I just turn it off and go to it later. I used to dance in the 90s at a very busy strip in Dallas called Baby Dolls. It goes on to say this, I still have nightmares about getting lost then finding myself on stage with men staring. It definitely was not for me. The money was fantastic. I needed the money bad. One friend even put herself through medical school. But it had a bad price. This goes on a little bit further about how they gave their life in this direction. Here's one phrase off the email. For our first time on stage, they made us a huge drink with lots of liquor to loosen us up. You see, I've seen this happen as we've done ministry and as we've engaged on the streets. Older, I mean, those who are already practicing stripping get their younger sisters. I know in one case, yeah, give them a little liquor, um, loosen them up. That happens at parties, doesn't it? Guys and girls. Doesn't it happen in the area of um, wanting sex, guys with girls, um, in the world of um, gay sex too, right? Here's what it says in the uh, email. I started to go to the gay bars after that. And I can tell you again of the stories and of the pain. And yes, this um, law out in California, they're trying to ban counseling. 
the law is wanting to say that nobody can counsel a young person under 17 or under 18 years old and tell them that they can change. Uh, the law, they want to bring out a law that says you're not allowed to tell them that this is wrong. But that's the very thing they're fighting with. When I've dealt with 14-year-olds and 15-year-olds and 17-year-olds, that's the issue. All of a sudden, because of what they've heard, what they've read, what they've come up into, the abuses they've gone through, whatever the issues are, there's a search for identity and sexual identity. Others are doing it. Others are explaining their experiences. And so some girls will try. Some boys will try. A lot of this goes on at college. And there is that sense of guilt, then uh, the power of arousal, the power of the sexual drive, peer pressure, everything else comes into play, and then um, and then jumping into the stuff. Yes, guilt is there. We're all, listen, let's be honest, all of us can. I mean, think back in your days, think about your sexual life. Not everybody waits till they get married. But then again, not everybody sexes around before they get married. God has a plan and it works well. It's safe. It's beautiful. It's um, it's honorable. And all of the fun and all of the pleasure and all of the power to procreate is there. In the context that God creates, I mean, God created the earth to spin on this axis, to be so far away from the sun. God created things so that we could be here and breathe the air and drink the water and feel the warmth of the sun. Alter creation, and you can alter existence. What we're talking about tonight is the arrogance in sexual addiction that drives, that drives hearts Lives, because of the conscience, drives individuals to desire to change everything, to transmute, to exchange the natural for the unnatural is not enough in some cases. Because the conscience is bugged. We're going to talk about conscience. What is conscience? Did you know that the scriptures teach that the law of God is written into the conscience, that in creation, I mean... If you lie and you know that you lie, you know that it's wrong, and maybe you're doing it to get something, to get out of something, nevertheless. I mean, without that conscience, think about it for a moment. If everybody lied, there couldn't... I mean, everybody. I mean, flat out, every day, every way, telephone calls, texting, at banks, I mean, we're going to say that they're already doing that in many places, Politically, yes. But I think in this term, you know, of lying, cheating, stealing, we don't want anybody to steal from us. We don't want anybody to lie to us. We don't want anybody to take from us. And so when we think in terms of the law of God that's imprinted, now the atheist thrusts out the law of God, but in his own heart, that sense of moral law is there. Not to lie, to live somewhat ethically, where does that come from? Well, I search deep within, and it's just there in my conscience. Well, the scripture says that God has put that law in your heart, the cardea, the center of who you are, and your conscience plays a part when you veer away from that natural created order. There is a, there is a accusing, there is a conviction, there is a sense of guilt Wouldn't you feel guilty? I mean, we talk about psychopaths and um, their inability to feel guilt or the power they have to burn the conscience to a level that they don't feel anything. That's a dangerous person. You know, when we sit around and we want to justify our lives, justify sin, justify lying, cheating, stealing, adultery, slaughtering, When we want to justify our own lives, and you ever see somebody just simply, I mean, they got caught red-handed, and they get angry, and they say they didn't, and they justify, and they blame everybody else. There's a person. There's a person that has to press the metal against their conscience to justify. they got to become arrogant to the point, here's... Here's the danger zone. To the point of um, burning 
their own conscience. We're going to talk about that tonight also. In burning the conscience, just about anything can go at that point, right? I mean, when it comes to sexual addictions and justifying them, pedophile, sex with the dead, bestiality, all the rest, when people try to justify, and the overwhelming majority of humanity, of history, of every other, I mean, the overwhelming majority of everything, let alone their conscience, says it's wrong. Yeah, there's books written now. Those who are in sexual addiction, sexual practices that are so unnatural, so bizarre, so transmuted, but yet in the books and in their discussions, they not only justify it, they invite people in to practice it themselves so that they can feel justified by the mutual practice of altering or transmuting God's creation, natural law. By the way, I want to invite you this week. we got two days away. We're going to be at the Fingerprints of the Supernatural Rise of Radical Evil Conference. We're going to be there on Friday night, L.A. Marzulli speaking. Saturday morning, I'll be speaking. In the afternoon, L.A. Marzulli again. So we've got Friday night and all day Saturday. We're going to look forward to some ministry there. I've been told that... Um, they got quite a few folks coming. The uh, Vienna Assembly of God, Vienna, Ohio, that's around the Ravenna, Warren. I mean, if you're in Ohio, if you're in Pennsylvania, I mean, you're very close. If you go to shatterthedarkness.net, right where it says, welcome, it's Wednesday, May 16th, 2012. There's, um, there's a link you can click to get the entire poster, and uh, it'll tell you about... Um, the address and the exact times and hey they're not charging anything up front it's just a, a love offering they're going to do while we're up there so we hope that you can come la marzuli good friend and uh, i'll see him friday night saturday maybe sunday too la and i will be then down in huttonsville west virginia for the uh, checkmate conference down there the next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, Pastor Butch Paul, take a look there. The uh, link is on the website. Chicago is building more, middle of sh middle of June, the Chicago Summit. and uh, So take a look at the conferences. We're going to be in a number of places and uh, look forward to going down to Cincinnati later in the fall, Newark, Ohio in the fall. And uh, there's Chechen Itza. There's a mission plan, and guess what we're going to do tonight? After this program, late tonight, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you can come back to this website, scroll down a little bit. You'll see where it says the Ragged Edge Wednesday, 10 p.m. Click where it says listen live. I'll, I'll be interviewing Ellie Marzuli. We're going to talk about the conference coming up. We're going to talk about Chechen Itza 2012 and all of the spiritual, um, well, the drive towards uh, December 21st, 2012 and some of the new revelations that have come out. We'll talk about the Upside Down Mountain in France, 20,000 people there waiting for the entities they believe are hiding in the mountain. That's right. They expect 100,000 people to be there by December 21st. Let me tell you about the broadest ramping up of spiritual deception in human history. Well, it's upon us right now. As prophesied, as Christ said it would be in the end of days. Hey, how you doing? Glad that you're here tonight. Glad that you're listening from the way that you do. By the way, we almost, you know, again, never say, but if you're interested in investing, supporting, and helping the program, hey, there's no um, commercials, no uh, products to sell. But if you're interested, on the Shatter site, click the tab that says support. If you'd like to send something in, P.O. Box 755, Uniontown, Ohio, 44685. We try to keep that to a zero or two or three seconds of information. Um, we will um, we will let you know from time to time about how we do all of this. And we are. We're out on the reap trips. We're out in the conferences and the counseling and the sharing. And um, let me say to those who do help, we are extremely grateful. Now, let's get into the program tonight. We've, we've got a lot to say about the issue of the conscience. And if you've got the web notes, there's a PDF file web notes 
And uh, we hope that you will be able to uh, get those download. I believe that uh, we should be on pages five, six, seven, something like that. Wednesday the 16th, take a look. Here's what it says. Point one, the fight to clear the conscience. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment, because I'm going to read to you out of Romans, out of the book of Romans 2.15. Here's what it says about the world. In contrast to the Jews that had the law of God, the, the written scripture, that they had on the outside to inform them and to speak to them and to um, literally be a schoolmaster to bring them ultimately to Christ when he came. But what about the rest of the world? Here's what it says. Concerning fallen humanity, here's what it says. Quote, Since they, referring to all of us, know that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Greek word kardeia. The emotions, the intellect, the will, all together. The centrality of you. God has written his law. The laws are written into our heart, literally. And here's what it says. Our consciences. That's, listen, I want you to know that without a conscience, I wonder what we, I, I wonder what humanity would be like. If you could just simply right now extract conscience, because conscience plays a part in stopping us and saying no, saying that's wrong, don't do that, with the uh, power to bring guilt. The scripture says it this way, their conscience is also bearing witness to what? The law of God. The way we were created. And you think in terms of the law of God, to know God, to walk with God. The law in for, in deals with the don't murder, don't lie, don't cheat, don't commit adultery, on and on and on. So the conscience, our conscience bears witness to the truth of God. Now here's what it says though. That conscience of ours and the thoughts that are there can either accuse us or seek to defend in other words, that inside of us, if we go to, you know, steal something, cheat, lie, do something we know is absolutely wrong, I'm going to confess something. I was probably six to seven years old. I think a first grader, that's in the days we used to walk to school, walk to grade school. On the way home, I stopped at the Miracle Mart right up the street from where I lived. I didn't have any money. So in that, I don't know how I learned this, but inside that little miracle mart, I found something I wanted. So I took it, put it under my shirt. I can't tell you, and I could go way back to that time when I was just a kid. I can tell you how I looked at the object. I didn't, I equated, I didn't have the money. I knew that it was wrong to steal. I looked around to see if anybody was looking. And I had to sneak. I had to figure out a way in which I could steal and get out of there. And you know what? You think that once you steal once, see, we weren't, we, we weren't raised in church. The house was pretty moral. I mean, we got our whippings in those days. We got in trouble, but there's something inside. That's the issue of the sin code, that nature that drives us. Why do we steal? Why do we cheat? Why do we lie? Why do we become arrogant? Why does anybody kill, rape, maim, destroy? I want you to think in terms of what's inside of us. See, this law of God is written there. And you know what? Sometimes uh, people get angry at the conviction and the guilt that follows when they begin to contemplate stealing, cheating, lying, or um, sex and around. I mean, when they know that it's wrong. When they know something is wrong, um, not just because of uh, society around us, because peer pressure can play a part. If everybody around you is doing it, and you know what this is all about when you were in high school and college, if everybody's doing something, drinking, smoking up, doing drugs, whatever it may be, racing your car down the road... They edge you on. They want you to do it. They want you to experience it. And usually, because the sin nature inside, you ever read this? You ever check it out? See, there is secular psychology 
But there's also biblical suke, I mean, revelation about the the conscience, the soul, who we really are, the construct of what we are. So when you go to lie and you know inside you shouldn't, do you blame it on everybody else? Because everybody else says don't lie, but then you get mad and say, I don't care what everybody else says, I'm going to lie. Don't cheat. I don't care what everybody else says. I'm not going to cheat. Did they write the law there? Did they put that into your heart? Is it just society that says don't slaughter people, don't rape people, don't be a racist, on and on and on? Is it just society? Step back. It's deep down within. It's in the cardia, the heart, the conscience. And your conscience bears witness with the truth of God. And the conscience is there to stop you, to say no when something is wrong, to to uh, say yes when something is right. It's kind of the alert. It's kind of the, the getting the check, that little red flag in the back of your head. It's uh, there to say, here's what, it's not only wrong, and the feeling of guilt, and even even deal with the um, thoughts that accuse, that deal with um, telling you. I mean, do you know sometimes that you go through the thought of the consequences? I mean, if you're going to do something wrong and you know it's wrong and you think in your head, this is what could happen. I mean, the truth is, in just being hedonistically, I mean, you just want to be like a sexual dog out there and be with anybody and everybody. You could die. AIDS, chlamydia, STDs, all the rest of those sexually transmitted, I mean, herpes, all these things, man, they're bad. These things affect you and they affect you and uh, they can alter your life, alter you for the future, alter you concerning children. So there's a danger zone when it comes just to loose hedonistic sex with anybody, any everybody. I mean... Th- AIDS and the transmission. You can die. So let's step back and and let's realize no matter what, I mean, let me tell you something. There's people that I know that are hedonistically. I mean, they're a hedonist. They are they are just committed. There's guys that are committed to have sex with every woman they can find and put a notch in their belt. There are women that are doing the same. There are those who use sex to gain um, jobs, money. There are those that have diseases and they don't tell their partner. As we said the other day, sex can be used as a weapon, but let's stop now to say and deal with the aspect of the arrogance in sexual addiction. The arrogance of those making money, billions, we mentioned it yesterday, $57 billion in the sex industry, porn and the rest. What about sex trafficking? I'm going to tell you this, I would say that most gay people that I've ever met, dealt with, ministered to, and know, that they would say that uh, human trafficking and making other boys and girls sex slaves so that the handlers and the pimps and the perverts can make all the money, uh, that they would say that is wrong. Wouldn't you say that is wrong? How do you know that's wrong? Oh, you see the agony, you see them taken from families, you see the pain, you see what's caused Okay, but it drops back to conscience. I want you to I want you to understand that today I am extremely thankful for conscience, thankful that God's law, even as a fallen human being in the 60s and 70s, as I lived and did what I did. I wasn't raised in church. I didn't know God. But I did a lot of things that I felt guilty and dirty and rotten for. I, I did a lot of things that um, I felt like I needed to make amends for. And the only way to kind of get out of that is to lie over top of your lies, over top of your lies, to the point that you justify and you justify and you justify and you rationalize. Did you know that a pedophile rationalizes and justifies and explains that it's all about love, it's all about the feelings, It's they care for the child, they love the child, they give the child gifts, they wouldn't harm the child, it's all about love? Did you know that pedophiles, by the tens of, tens of thousands, 
their drive to have sex with kids is driven with the rationalization, this is love, this is um, good, this is good for them. Did you know that? Now you and I are going to sit back and say, that's sick. I told you about the author of the book, The Necromantic Ritual, Sex with the Dead. There is justification for that uh, practice. There's the way in which deep within us we've been infected. The Bible calls it sarks. If you want to understand the, the, the intrusion of what is uh, that, that radical evil, that, the sin nature, the sin code, the sarks, Romans 8. Do a study and take a look at the drivenness. It's as if God has revealed that the sin nature inside of fallen mankind is almost like it's alive, that it that it drives us forward to, to do everything. Matter of fact, it says the sin nature is hostile to God. Doesn't want to submit to God. Doesn't want to submit to the law of God. Doesn't want to not lie. Doesn't want to not cheat. The sin nature wants you to cheat, wants you to be greedy, wants you to be racist. The sin nature wants you to sin sexually, get addicted. The sin nature wants you to transmute everything. Did you know that? That's where the desire comes in. And I read stories in the last few days, and it it, it comes from all kinds of sexual addictions, let alone homosexuality. One person says, if God gave me these desires, this is a man, if God gave me sexual desires for other men, then why would God tell me that I can't do it, can't have sex with men? The answer, God did not give you that desire for men. We've got to stop and step back and see where it came from. The sin code has within it every possible hostility and practice that would go against the natural created order and the law of God. The sin nature drives humanity to exchange what is natural for the unnatural. To twist us, transmute us, and pervert us. The sin nature drives humanity to do what we do. And it's not just against society, peers, history. It has everything to do with it being against God. God's against racism. Most everybody would say hallelujah. God is against slaughtering other human beings, just going out and murdering. I guess we'd have to say hallelujah. God is against, and that's written within us, he's against rape, he's against incest, he's against pedophilia, he's against necrophilia. He's against these. He's against somebody coming to your home and a home invasion, robbing, raping. Shooting, stabbing, stealing. He's against this. So it's not just um, situation ethics and how the world goes and what the majority think and the rest. It has to do with what's embedded in you. Embedded in you, whether you're lost or saved, whether you know God right now or not, whether the Spirit of God is inside of you right now or not, embedded deep, deeper than your DNA is the law of God. And a conscience that can be pricked, that can be um, that can flag, in a sense, the wrong direction, the wrong choices. That guilt is a good thing, don't you think? I mean, you don't like it in in the times in which you you were doing the wrong. How do you get rid of that guilt? Bury it. Justify your actions. Everybody else is doing it. Others done it to me. Somebody stole from me, so I'm going to steal. Somebody cheated against me, so I'm going to cheat. Somebody raped me, so I'm going to rape. Is that it? Is that the way we rationalize? I mean, if you don't understand the sin, nature, the drive, and then the satanic side, the actual demonic side, then you're going to miss out. You're going to miss out from understanding all of the drivenness, all of the drive, all of the stuff inside of us that moves us to do things that is contrary to God, contrary to the law of God written inside that bothers our conscience. Let me read the email again real quick here. The individual that sends this to me tells me about um, about their sexual decadence, their addiction, 
and then says these words, quote, this is a guy that's gotten free. This is a guy that now says, thank God I am now free. They have recently come to Christ. But they say these words, quote, I know full well how the demonic comes in through certain sexual practices. I mean, today, we're not dealing with just homosexuality. We're dealing with astral sex. We're dealing with incubus succubus. We're dealing with demonic engagement, people coming in. you got to realize this is real counsel that's going on all around. you got to realize that there are individuals out there that I have engaged and dealt with that go through rituals and go through what they believe, leaving their body to go engage. Here's one guy. I dealt with him. When I got to his house, I said, why do you have this circle here and all these candles? He put his head down with a little bit of shame. He said, I was, I was practicing what I was taught. I was practicing leaving my body. He was doing a little ritual thing that he, was, uh, that he had learned from someone. Well, the, actually, he learned this from the abuser that he had in his life. And so he was learning to go out of his body. And I said, well, where, was, where do you go? He looked down again, and he finally looked back in my face and said, well, he said, Pastor Russ, do you remember going into the counseling center and meeting the assistant psychologist counselor? You know, the blonde lady, the pretty lady? I said, yeah. He says, well, I've been asked to projecting out, going to her apartment, going to her bedroom, trying to touch her and engage her sexually. Yet he knew it was wrong. See, though we know things are wrong, the sin nature inside drives. The sin nature seeks to justify sin. Satan himself and demonic spirits can also give that, well, as this person talks about here. He says, I won't go into detail here, but certain practices have a demonic charge to them, which is very addictive. I told you about the professor the other day that I sat in front of and listened as he told me out of his mouth, uh, sex with a demonic entity. He was filled with lust and sensual discussion to the point. Well, he, you know what he, you know what he said when I shut him down, when I had to tell him stop. Don't tell me anymore. Is when he said, man, he's telling me about sex with a demon. And he says, man, it's the best. He was going into describing. I said, stop it. I don't even want to hear. Now, this person has also gotten freed, delivered, and released. Let's touch on the issue of the conscience. And um, it being there, and the law of God being there, and what is good. I mean, we know that it's good to love people, to treat people fairly, and not cheat, and not steal, and not lie, and not commit sexual sexual sins. Porneus is the Greek word used in the New Testament about sexual immorality, but it includes um, all of those issues of homosexuality, a man with a man, a woman with a woman. All kinds. See, in the Old Testament, they had every kind of sexual practice, including sex with the dead. Demonized sex. I reported to you Monday night, Graham, Graham Hancock reports in his book as a researcher worldwide that all shamans, see everybody thinks they're, the, they're spiritual men and or women, right? That all shamans have sexual partners in the astral realm that they're constantly having sex with. Sexually addicted. Right now, there's those who are listening, you're sexually addicted. Regardless of the avenue, you're sexually addicted. There are, there's going to be gays and, and homosexuals that will get this, and at first they're going to become angry. There have been those who have hacked programs and done things because they become extremely angry arrogantly angry when somebody says to them that homosexuality is wrong. That's why they're trying to create loss. Now let's go through this, okay, when it deals with conscience. The fight to clear the conscience, that's a dangerous thing. Number one, the grace of conscience. Now we read about this already in Romans 2. It's the issue that God has given us that and we have that concerning our interaction. 
when I'm looking at individuals, I know that I shouldn't lie, steal, cheat, all those kind of things. That's true of all of us. And it's placed there by God. But it involves also the practice sexually. Notice that when we marry the spouse, we engage on a sexual level there. There's nothing but blessing. There's nothing but this is right. There's nothing but we're free. There's nothing but this is okay. This is good. But when we go outside, of the created order, the law of God written inside, the moral law, well then guilt and accusation from the inside comes. Now, that's the next thing. It's evidence of the factors of sin. How do we know that lying is wrong? I mean, the word wrong is, I mean, sin. Lying is a sin. Cheating is a sin. Raping is a sin. Incest is a sin, right? Racism is a sin, right? It's all wrong. It's a sin. God says that it's wrong. And in our hearts and our conscience bears witness, we know that it's wrong. But because of the sin nature, the fall of the human race, and because of Satan's actual presence here and the demonic, there is a drivenness to do it. And it's without question, we all sin. In all kinds of, I've never robbed a bank. I've never shot a human being. It's not about all of the sins that we do, but about areas and about the actual sin nature. I want to again point you to Romans 8 for you to study on your own and take a look at the description of the law of sin and death and the law of the spirit of life. One of those two operating, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's an operating work within you. Now, there's a fight. There's a fight concerning um, sin and Satan would love to burn the conscience. I mean, just literally. I mean, we can read even in the scriptures where it talks about how certain people do this. They, um, they sear their conscience as with a hot iron. Have you ever read that? It's, um, it's from a powerful little Greek word that deals with cauterizing. It's out of 1 Timothy 4, 2, when it says that such teachings in reference to um, the false teachers and their sexual and occult teachings, it mentions them as hypocritical liars. They're the ones promoting what is false, the ones promoting what is not true. Here's what it says about those who are really out there arrogantly promoting sin, promoting practices that are against nature and against the law of God. Here's what it says about them. Whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Think about NAMBLA, the uh, North American uh, Man-Boy Love Association thing. Think about their lobbying in the political realm, uh, demanding to change laws to say that sex with children is okay. They're driven, they're driven to clear their conscience. I mean, that's, that's what happens when sin is really taking root and is really deep. When somebody gives themselves so deep into the world of sin, and if there is demonic connection with that, there's going to be a drive to literally bury the conscience. When someone hears the word of God, this is why a backslidden believer in Christ, they don't want to go to church, they don't want to go to the scripture, they don't want to read. But you got to realize that conscience, man, that's a gift of God. That's where God can speak into and deal, and um, that's where conviction can come. That's where the Spirit of God can convict of uh, sin, righteousness, and judgment, our lostness concerning where we stand. If you're listening to me right now, and you don't know God, and the Spirit of God is not inside of you, sin rules, Satan has rights, hell has rights, you're separated from God, how are you going to get out of that? How are you going to fix that? You can uh, rub some Reiki stones together. You can go read tarot cards. You can have a psychic give you a reading, but that doesn't change anything. Because deep down inside of you is a abnormal injected presence. It's called the Sarks, sin nature. Satan, because of that, has rights to your life. Want to read about that? 
the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. You read about it in verse 1 and 2. Satan has operating rights in you if you are lost, that is, separated from God. And that means God's spirit is not inside of you, and his presence and power is not inside of you. Here's the good news right now, and you're listening. Divine appointment, my dear friend. Wherever you are from 105 countries of the world or where you're at in your city right now, live listening, this is a divine appointment. This is about God reaching out to you. Jesus Christ, why did he go to that cross? Did you know that he was called the sin bearer? Did you know he was sent to conquer? We're going to talk about that towards the end in all that he's done. The greatest friend that a sexually addicted person has, or a gambling addiction, or drug addiction, or uh, anger addiction, or just living in the misery of your sin. Every backslidden believer listening right now, you know that Jesus is King. He is Lord. It's not that God moved far away. You did. And let me give you this. This is for you. By the leading of the Spirit of God, this is for you. The book of James chapter 4. Back, backslidden believers, you know quenching the Spirit of God. You know grieving the Spirit of God. God has an answer. God has a way back. God has a way to clear everything Make it right. God summoning you, calling you. James chapter 4 for you tonight. If you're lost and you don't even know Jesus, and before we get to the end of this program tonight, I want you to know that he is alive from the dead, that he died on the cross on your behalf to conquer the drive, the sin drives, and Satan's work. He can come in to deliver you total forgiveness. His presence and power coming in to cleanse you and to snap the power of the sin nature, to break the chains of Satan's rights, to um, exchange you, literally in this sense, from Satan's hand into the hand of God. When you turn to the living Christ and believe on him as Savior and Lord, when you turn to him and say, Jesus, I receive you and all that you've done at the cross, I ask you to come into my life with your power. Forgive me, deliver me, save me. Grant me the Spirit of God inside. He will. The love of God, the joy of the presence of God will come into your life. The Word of God says, Whosoever... Let me say to the one that thinks they're such a big sinner they can't come. Jesus Christ dying on the cross, bearing your sin, is bigger than your sin. He's bigger than the sum total collective sin of the human race for all of history. He's the hero for humanity. Christ, the conqueror. Of sin. Grace is bigger. Mercy is bigger. The love of God is bigger. God wants you to be saved. God wants you to be forgiven, set free, and um, the living Christ to come inside of you and also give you the gift. We call it eternal life. It is indestructible immortality. That's what God gives us in Christ. Back real quick here for a moment. Sometimes when someone gives, and again, let me give you Romans chapter 1. I did this the last couple of days. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 on down. Look what it says about how mankind, that is, those who want to sin and sin deeply and sin broadly and sin more, sin drives you to alter everything, alter your life, transmute everything about you and seeks to burn your conscience and sear it so you'll have no conflict in the head. Thank God you're listening right now. Thank God by divine appointment you're listening and you still have that conscience and God the Holy Spirit can, yes, bring the guilt, but He brings the light that brings the answer that eliminates, sets you free totally from the guilt when Jesus comes in your life and you receive His forgiveness and his power, and his love, and his presence. The arrogant that live in sin on all levels seek to change. I'm going to list them. When people are driven by their sin, they practice it, practice it, practice it, practice it. 
exchange the natural use for unnatural, when that then is accompanied sometimes by demonic empowerment, attachment, influence, then people are driven to change nature. People are driven to burn conscience. People then are driven to change society, to stand up and scream and say, it's all right to be a racist. It's all right to be a cheater, a stealer. It's all right to be arrogant in the world of finance and arrogantly with greed steal from everybody else regardless of the cost of their lives. It's okay to drive drunk and kill a family, a mom and children. It's okay. And this is this is what this is what somebody who's burning their conscience out. They want to scream at society and say, no, it's not wrong. Having sex with every woman, having sex with every man, committing adultery. Yeah, your spouse says it's wrong. Is that what you want to happen? Your spouse to go out and commit adultery, have sex with all kinds of other people? I don't think so. I think we understand what betrayal is. I think we understand what the damage that could be done. But even there, Christ can bring healing, forgiveness, restoration. That's what God's all about. Reconciliation. His power is involved. Those who sin and sin deeply and sin consistently and join the dark side in an arrogant Desire to transmute everything. Transmute biology. I mean, think about homosexuality for a moment. A man with a man, biologically, on a physiological level, the parts don't really fit. On a biological level, you can't procreate. We understand that a man and a woman, the parts fit. Procreation is possible. And that uh, the overwhelming mass majority of humanity, even in a fallen world, clearly know. Most gays that I've ever dealt with or known or talked to, they know that it's not natural, that it's unnatural. Those having sex with the dead, those committing incest, they know that it's unnatural, that it's wrong. But sin, Satan, for the sake of self-gratification, and then eventually the conscience, in order to burn conscience, a person has to stand up and rip out the conscience, in, in a sense, by declaring that their wrong is right and that what is right is really wrong. So they want to make laws in California, laws in the books, laws in Canada. You're not allowed to stand up and say homosexuality is a sin. Not only does the drive to, for self-justification lead to change society, change psychology, they changed the American Psychological Association's past view. I mentioned the other day, get the book. Homosexuality and the politics of truth. Homosexuality and the politics of truth. The drivenness with the power of the sin nature and the dark side to justify an unnatural practice and then demand that everything else must change so your conscience won't be bothered. It's it's a drivenness from the inside where that drive, the sin nature drives to say, hey, it's okay to kill, steal, cheat, lie, to go against God, to hate God, curse God, mock God, to sexually go against nature. Give in to that for so long, then you're going to be out there screaming out loud, trying to change everything, change even change God, change theology. The propensity of the homosexual movement and other sexually addicted practices are change theology, change the church, change God, transmute the conscience. The idea that, um, you know what, this must mean, there's a desire there to say, okay, this is a biological issue and we have been created this way, homosexuality, uh, incest, rape, it's in the genes. Let me mention another book to read. Not in our genes. Biology Ideology and human nature. Here's what it says at the bottom of the book. This is a rip-roaring dismantling of the recent rise of biologist, biologistic interpretations of why we behave as we do. So instead of um, biological determinism, 
See, that's, that's again, biology and psychology taking out the factor of the sin nature, the drive, the fallenness within. What is that within? There is a real fallen principle animating beyond DNA, animating us that came in our, in our rejection of God and acceptance of the Luciferic lie. The exchange of the glory of God for finite. The exchange of the truth of God for the lie. Read Romans 1, 18 on down. How mankind, in order to, um, you know, suppress, they got to, the, the way that they can live wickedly, suppress the truth. Exchange the glory of God for finite things. Exchange the truth of God for a lie. And then the spiral of going down till you're applauding and pumping and pushing that which is nothing but sheer transmuted sin that um, that that all of hell applauds. And the mercy of God now seeks to break into your life, break into the lives of millions. There are here's the news: tens of thousands of ex-gays, ex-sex addicts, they've gotten free. I looked at YouTube today, ex-lesbians, ex-homosexuals that came to Christ. Those who are not ex but into it deeply, they don't want that to be true. They want to create laws to outlaw anybody saying that homosexuality is a sin and that anybody can change. Thus, their position not only damns themselves, but damns those around them into thinking and holding to a lie that you can't change. you got to live twisted, transmuted, altered. You can try to live that life, beat your breast, scream, or realize that there is a Savior on a cross who died for the sum total of all sin, of all time, of all kinds, Christ. His presence, His power. You ever go to it? You ever go to the Gospel of John? I would even say this. Go to the Gospel of Mark if you're somebody searching, somebody seeking. If you want to see somebody that cares about you, somebody that loves you. Point two in the notes, the power of Jesus. Who is He? God in human flesh, Savior, Healer, Deliverer. Why was He sent? He was sent for us. God so loved the world. Nobody loves you more. I'm hitting, uh, listen, I am speaking here tonight. I know I love you, but God loves you. How He lived, how He engaged us. So great love, so great mercy. Look on down the notes here. Look to the Gospel of Mark dynamic picture of God in action in Christ for you. We're at the end of the hour. This is Russ Dizdar, Shatters Live broadcast, shatterthedarkness.net. We love you. God bless. Good night.